Good evening. Hi, my, my name is uh, John Visti. I'm the uh, program manager at the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service. <clears throat> on behalf of, w w it's known as WIPS, by the way. <laughs> um, on behalf of WIPS and the University of Wisconsin, uh, Marathon County, I would like to welcome you to the third James F. Veninga Lecture on Religion and Politics. Um, in addition to WIPS and uh, UWMC, this year's lecture is possible because of the support from the BA and Esther Greenheck Foundation, the Lecture and Fine Arts Series at UWMC, and the students at UWMC who have contributed some of their fees for this event. Uh, James Veninga was the dean of UWMC from 2000 to 2007. <laughs> the reason that this building exists, that WIPS exists, and that the lecture series exists is in large part due to his efforts. He had a passion for the study of religion and society and urged us to establish this lecture series. Shortly after I began working at WIPS, a little over a year ago, uh, Dr. Veninga sent me a list of people that he had recommended as speakers for this event. It was an impressive list, extremely well annotated, and included our speaker tonight, Munir Jiwa. In his note, he described Munir's accomplishments and research interests but noted that he was a little bit biased in favor of Munir because Munir had been on his daughter's dissertation committee when she received her PhD <laughs> at the Graduate <laughs> Theological Union in Berkeley, California. We are honored tonight with the presence of, of James Veninga's wife, Catherine, and his daughter, Jennifer, who have come all the way from Texas to attend this lecture. Um, it is therefore most appropriate, because of all these wonderful connections, that Jennifer, Dr. Veninga, will introduce our speaker tonight. Good evening. It is truly an honor to be here tonight for the 2014 James F. Veninga Lecture and to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Munir Jiwa as tonight's speaker. It is a rare pleasure to experience the convergence of several special areas of one's life, and tonight I have just that opportunity. Several years ago, um, as John mentioned, my father and I were talking about possibilities uh, for speakers for the series, folks who could address contemporary issues having to do with Islam, religion, and politics. I immediately suggested Munir Jiwa, a dear mentor, scholar, and a professor at the GTU. Tonight, that, sec that suggestion has come to fruition. Dr. Jiwa's commitment to humane scholarship in the service of the global public good is exactly what my father so deeply valued in his vision of a more just and democratic world. He would be thrilled by the rich conversations that we have had already today and will have tonight on Islam and media, as I am as well. So thank you to Munir. Munir Jiwa is the founding director of the Center for Islamic Studies and associate professor of Islamic Studies at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. He is also a visiting scholar at the Institutions and Governance Program at UC Berkeley. He holds a PhD in anthropology from Columbia University and a master's in world religions from Harvard Divinity School. His research interests include Islam and Muslims in the West, media, aesthetics, secularism, and religious formation. He is the recipient of awards and grants from Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation, Ford Foundation, Henry Luce Foundation, and the Social Science Research Council. Since 1995, he has worked with Religions for Peace, on interreligious youth programs around the world, including Bosnia, East and West Africa, the Middle East, and Japan. 
Currently, he is serving on the Islamic Studies Advisory Group for Public Education at Stanford University, on the Steering Committee for the Contemporary Islam Group at the American Academy of Religion, and an advisor to the Islamophobia Documentation and Research Project at the Center for Race and Gender at UC Berkeley. He has a manuscript under review titled Exhibiting Muslims, Art, Politics, and Identity in New York City. There is no one better fitted to give our lecture tonight than Munir Jiwa. Will you please welcome him tonight? I want to wish you greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Um, and just thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm really honored and deeply moved and touched. Uh, the more I've read about uh, Dr. James Veninga, I feel like it, it's, it's a humbling experience um, and a tall order uh, to try to even live out some of his legacy. Um, I'm especially uh, grateful to his family uh, for coming over to Dr. Jenny Veninga, Dr. Catherine Veninga. I uh, also want to thank John uh, Visti, who's been uh, coordinating with me on these programs, on, on this program, um, over a year ago. And then again this spring, we revisited um, the uh, possibility of, of this program. I want to thank the University of Wisconsin, uh, both uh, Marathon County and Stevens Point. I had a chance earlier today to speak at that campus, and it was just wonderful. I'm looking forward to a fruitful conversation today as well. I especially want to thank the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service. I think, again, um, Jim's vision is something that we all can aspire to live out, and I'm hoping that um, some of my presentation tonight, some of my thoughts and reflections can bring some justice to his very large legacy and the hope he instills in all of us. I also want to thank the Dean, uh, Keith Montgomery, for hosting and for all the warmth and hospitality uh, Wasa has uh, given me. I, maybe just a small story I can share. I almost missed my connection in Minneapolis yesterday. And I got on the flight, and I'm seated next to these just wonderful, charming people who are like, what brings you to Wasa? And I said, well, I'm giving a series of lectures. She did a double take, and she said, hey, I saw you in the Herald. <laughs> and she <laughs> immediately invited me to dinner, asked if I could be dri uh, driven home. Uh, where was I staying? Could I come visit their office the next day? She, she said, I hear that you're going to be visiting clergy. Now, if you can't get to all the churches, at least come to our office. You'll have the best view of all the steeples in Wausau. <laughs> so I'm hoping that might still be a possibility. But um, I'm really, really grateful for the, the warm warmth and hospitality, um, it's not to be found everywhere. So this is very, a very special place, and I look forward to being um, back again. What I'd like to do today is to go over what I've been calling the sort of five media pillars of Islam. Um, many of us have heard of the five pillars of Islam, and it's a play on, um, I'll just bring it up. Um, So it's, it's, a, it's a play on the five pillars of Islam. As we know, the five pillars are what sort of uh, um, Muslims adhere to um, in terms of the Islamic tradition. But the five media pillars, I'm pointing to the way in which the media in particular, and I'm focusing on news media, but this is more largely uh, multimedia, um, social media, that focus around certain frames and certain themes when it comes to Islam and Muslims in the public sphere. So what I'd like to do is to go over um, some of those frames um, and then to look at each one of those five media frames uh, one by one to look at how these frames actually um, and these tropes uh, generate the kind of conversations we have around Islam and Muslims today and how they actually affect our social relations with the Islamic tradition and Muslims. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that at the end we'll have uh, enough time for uh, Q&A, so I'll, I'll welcome your, um, your questions uh, uh, at, at the end. Sorry, I'm not always seeing what's up there on this screen, so it takes me a, a minute to, um, to go over it. So I'll go over uh, this, uh, this idea of framing um, and looking at George Lakoff, the uh, linguist and cognitive scientist who looks at framing as 
sort of mental structures. I'll then kind of go into uh, the five media pillars that I'm talking about uh, and that I've been researching um, and looking at the different sort of frames that are used. Um, they'll, I think most of those frames will be familiar to you, um, but we can look at and debate uh, the kind of content of those frames. Then I'll look at um, some of the nine counterintuitive uh, research findings from a very large survey done of the Muslim world by the Gallup uh, Foundation. So uh, the Gallup report kind of uh, gives us some, some of their research findings and it's published in a book called Who Speaks for Islam? What a Billion Muslims Really Think. Um, I'll try to close with some examples of pluralism within the Islamic tradition, looking at um, some instances of the rise of Islamophobia and then how Muslim communities and more largely in the U.S. Um, ways in which uh, they are being um, countered uh, by Muslims themselves using a variety of, of, of multimedia. So framing. Um, as I mentioned, George Lakoff, uh, who's a professor at uh, UC Berkeley in the linguistics department, you probably, you might not know the name, but you probably remember the, the title of his book called um, um, Don't Think of an Elephant. Uh, right, and his point being is that as soon as you say don't think of an elephant, you'll think of an elephant. Um, and he begins um, his book by talking about uh, frames in this way. He says, frames are mental structures that change the way we see the world. As a result, they shape the goals we seek, the plans we make, the way we act, and what counts as good or bad outcome of our actions. In politics, our frames shape our social policies, and the institutions we form to carry out our policies. To change our frame is to change all of this. Reframing is social change. So he sees change, uh, framing as a larger kind of process, not just the ways in which we think about an issue, but in fact it's entire apparatus of mental structures and how we relate to, for example in this case, if we have a frame about Islam and Muslims, it's usually that frame that we then end up using to encounter um, uh, Muslims. Um, related to these uh, sort of framing devices he talks about, there's certain kinds of questions that emerge. How do we come to know something? You know, in this day of media sort of technology, a lot of what we come to learn about is really through sort of a, a pop culture or through very s sort of small news sound bites or through, uh, you know, it could be through friends, it could be our historical understanding of others, it could be what our families say about uh, those religious others, or in this case, Islam and Muslims. Um, and our learning comes from a variety of platforms. And it's increasingly difficult with all that's out there in social media and the variety of media, how to sift through that to see you know, what versions are correct, what versions aren't, um, and how do we actually uh, come to know uh, Islam and Muslims. So we might ask ourselves that. Is it through news media? Is it through an, a course? Is it through lectures like this? Um, and, uh, and so you know, th I think that's an important question to ask of ourselves, how it is that we make judgments uh, thoughts uh, about others, and how do we actually remember that? So this idea that, you know, if you see uh, repeated sort of news stories about Islam and media, uh, sorry, Islam and Muslims in the media, and Muslims as terrorists, um, you know, we can point to the media. So every time we think of Muslims, how we remember them is usually through that story. Um, and so what needs to happen is to nuance those stories, which usually news media don't like to do because news media are not in the habit of providing um, a lot of context. Uh, they're looking at snippets and sound bites, whereas in academia and uh, you know, forums like this, we're actually trying to look at the complexity. So there's this kind of public um, uh, representation of Islam and Muslims that are in snippets and sound bites. Of course, there is a reality of you know, Muslims in, in the world today as, as terrorists. So we have to take that, uh, you know, um, uh, as a reality. We also have to look at then the representation and what kinds of alternative representations there might be to counter um, some of these um, uh, realities and some that are real, but also many that are um, imagined. Uh, the next is the importance of context. So um, the idea that once we come to know something about Islam and Muslims, what are the multiple ways in which we end up um, nuancing that which we come to know about in the media, right? So if we hear about negative stories about Muslims uh, and Islam in the media, which are usually, uh, you know, they're usually negative. Uh, I mean, the first 
top five stories today are, uh, you know, all Islam related and they're not very positive, um, right? What are the other ways that we attempt to counter that? Um, so we could say, well, this forum is, is, is a way, education is another way, or we might read something, or we might, you know, have Muslims in our families, or we've done interfaith work, or we've just, you know, um, developed a sensibility that, look, not everything that we get in media necessarily accounts for the realities of, of Muslim life. And I would argue that's a huge disconnect. Um, many Muslims ourselves are often at a loss when we see these news media stories of us being represented, we, we don't think of ourselves in those ways. So often it's not just trying to explain to the general public that this is not who we really are. We, ex we attempt to make sense of it in, in our own communities as well. So a lot of what we're seeing in the news media is just as shocking uh, to many Muslims. Um, so I think I just want to put that out there as saying that as the general non-Muslim public attempts to make sense of a lot of uh, the negative stereotypes and the negativity around Islam and Muslims, Muslims ourselves struggle to define our tradition, define uh, the authority in our traditions, and um, an attempt to make meaning of, of the kind of violence that we, um, that we see. Let me move to, the, um, to these five media pillars that I have uh, uh, mentioned. So the first uh, media pillar is 9-11 uh, as the kind of temporal trope uh, through which we come to understand um, uh, Islam and Muslims. It's uh, obviously a very, uh, it's a negative trope in the sense that, you know, Muslims enter the public sphere in much more um, urgent um, ways than uh, Muslims were, uh, uh, you know, um, introduced to the public in the past. So we have this sense that um, we have this negative event, you know, it's a, a violent event, and Muslims are all of a sudden now um, on this kind of stage, world stage, but American stage. So 9-11 becomes this kind of marker for how we begin to understand um, Islam and Muslims. One of the problems, several problems with this, is that, um, again, it, be, you know, it introduces Muslims in a negative way, and we have to account for the fact that, well, there were Muslims who carried out these attacks, so we have to account for those things. Right? Um, but the way in which we do that is not always nuanced, uh, and I'll get back to that a bit later. The second point about 9-11 is that it, um, when we begin to think about Muslims in this country just from 9-11, it forgets the very long history of Islam and Muslims in this country, right? So um, uh, the, uh, you know, there are uh, studies, many studies that show that Muslims were here right uh, during the slave trade and were here even before the founding of this nation. Sylvian Diouf's book, um, Servants of Allah, uh, African Muslims Enslaved in the America, or Alan Austin's book, um, show that up to about 20% of the slaves who came over in the Atlantic slave trade were Muslims. And we have accounts and records of them practicing their faith, um, uh, praying, uh, you know, giving um, uh, charity even when it was in very difficult situations, um, you know, imagining what it would be like to make the pilgrimage. And as we know, the pilgrimage to Mecca is just a beginning this week, um, very important um, time for Muslims, also an important time as Muslims reconnect to their Abrahamic tradition. I would argue that the Hajj and the daily prayers for Muslims is always a constant reminder of how Muslims are part of this larger Abrahamic uh, tradition. Um, so they're exemplified in the five daily prayers uh, and the Hajj. Um, and so we forget, you know, when we begin the history of Muslims after 9-11, we forget that there's a very large and long history of, of Muslims in the West. Amongst Muslims, um, the problem has been that we never really account for that history of Islam in America because we often see African American history, which is predominantly the history of Islam in America, as uh, not being Islamic enough, all right, or being too heterodox. So we often think, well, oh, we're, what we're talking about is the nation of Islam or preceding that, the Moorish Science Temple, and these are not real Muslims. Um, and I would argue that, in fact, uh, as, as do Sylvian Diouf and Alan Austin and other scholars, that if we do that, we actually forget the long history and legacy of Muslims in all their diversity who have actually been here and who have struggled to maintain their uh, diverse traditions. 
uh, right? And it's that legacy, in fact, that has allowed for a lot of uh, Muslims who have come here, you know, after the sort of 65 Immigration Act, um, who are coming increasingly to the U.S., who have um, sort of, who are indebted to that history. So whether we sort of agree with their practices or not, their Islamic practices, it's certainly part of Islamic history, and I would argue, in fact, it's just American history, um, right? So African-American history, African-American Muslim or Islamic history is, in fact, uh, just American history. The other uh, issue around 9-11, um, you probably, and this is a kind of example of how the media uh, uses a story or... Um, you know, exposes a story and then it sort of dies away and then it comes back. Um, many of you might remember the um, so-called Ground Zero Mosque controversy, uh, what's really called the Park 51 uh, Mosque. Um, well, in, in fall 2009, when that story broke, it actually, it was Fox News of all news stations that said, well, it sounds like a good plan. Uh, you know, here's going to be a mosque, but it's actually a, a community center that's sort of modeled like uh, on the YMCA or the JCC, the Jewish Community Center. Uh, it's going to be an interfaith center. It's going to have uh, sporting facilities. It's going to have um, culinary school, um, and it's going to give back to the community. Um, and other things were being said, well, you know, it's, it's especially great because the Imam, Imam Faisal, uh, is a Sufi, and you know Sufis are the sort of Islam light version, and they're the spiritual ones, and therefore the hence the good Muslims. I'll I'll read a quote later on that, which I find um, really interesting from um, Andrew Shryock's book Islamophobia, Islamophilia. But um, one of the interesting things it was it was Fox News in late uh, fall 2009 that said you know this uh, it's not a bad thing it's a good thing if you know Muslims are taking responsibility to bring back you know interfaith dialogue and you know establishing their communities in these in these great ways and we should be supportive. Well, during midterm elections May uh, 2010, the story broke again, but it broke this time with Pamela Geller who heads. Uh, what one could term an Islamophobic organization called Stop the Islamization of America. Uh, and the story breaks in a way that's, um, watch out, this is the Ground Zero Victory Mosque. It's, uh, it's a, a place that you should really be careful about. It's uh, going to be a ground for jihadis, jihadi recruiting. That so-called Sufi imam is no Sufi at all. Uh, look at his history. So there's a lot of name calling, a lot of sort of like, are we going to be able to deal with this uh, so-called polluted space of the mosque, uh, polluting this, the sanctity of a space like Ground Zero, and it was actually pitched like that. It's interesting also, during the midterm elections, that becomes such a, a wedge um, issue. There were folks who said they would, rather have, um, they would have, rather have a strip club in that area than the mosque, so that was one sort of thing. So when you took polls, it was uh, more favorable towards uh, strip clubs rather than the mosque. And again, the story was, well, this mosque actually might be the breeding ground for jihadis, and you can't really trust Muslims. It was Michael Moore, many of you, of you who know him, uh, filmmaker, who said, I don't, want a ground, uh, I don't want a mosque near Ground Zero, I want it on Ground Zero. It was a kind of provocative statement, trying to allude to the fact that there were already two prayer spaces within the Twin Towers that were dedicated for Muslims to pray and others to pray in. So it wasn't like this was new. Um, the other thing about the story was, in Manhattan itself, there weren't that many people who didn't want the mosque to take place. It's, it's the more you moved out, um, it moved from a local story of, yes, of acceptance to a national story of beware, j the jihadis are taking over. And there's all this stuff about the creeping Sharia. Um, this is the way you know, Sharia will enter. And I'll provide another example later about how Sharia enters through another sort of comedic way. So this story becomes a national story. The local story, what's interesting is, um, you know, when we think about how stories take localized shape and how they become national and then they, how they take off on social media, these can look very different. So the way I was participating in that story was a very different experience. Um, I was part of the conversations about Park 51 being the greenest building in New York or, or attempting to be the greenest build, building, how it would provide um, culinary, you know, what materials it would actually use for the building, how, what the plexiglass would be for the basketball courts. So it was very kind of localized conversations about the actual architecture, but the national story was one that was really about the jihadis are taking over, be careful of this, uh, mosque taking over, it's going to be a recruiting ground. And then 
you know, after the ele midterm elections, the, the story died out. So many of us don't even know what's happened to that story. But because of that negative exposure, Park 51 still struggles to find its funding. In fact, from Muslim communities themselves who say, well, if, if it's that negative a story, we probably don't want much to do with it. So it's lost a lot of um, Muslim support as well for, for a variety of reasons. But it just shows how a story, a local story, becomes national and then how it dies down, and yet the struggle to build that mosque um, still continues. The next frame is um, one of um, violence, terrorism, fundamentalism. So as we all know, these words, jihad, al-Qaeda, Taliban, madrasa, these are all English words. Um, <clears throat> I argue that you know, even most of us might not even know their, root, uh, their roots, and, um, and it may not matter. They are English words. They're used now in the English language, and uh, they're familiar to all of us. So again, when we think of Islam and Muslims, it's usually through these kinds of terms and not other ones. Um, you know, maslaha or the common good, which is important term in the Islamic tradition, I don't think has ever entered the public, right? But we always talk about maslaha and the common good. Uh, how, why is it that that term doesn't come to define uh, Muslims? So there are these uh, terms, and of course related to that are um, you know, issues around war and violence, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Palestine, Guantanamo Bay, Abu Ghraib, the Danish cartoons, etc. Um, I'll just cite one example, uh, maybe from the Danish cartoons uh, around this, and I'm always uh, apprehensive to talk about this because uh, Dr. Jenny Veninga has written a book on this and her dissertation is on this, so you actually want to check out her book for more nuance, um, you know, which is Secularism, Theology, and Islam, and it's, a, it's really around the Danish car cartoon crisis of 2005. What's interesting about this is um, some of the responses were you know, why, why do Muslims get so sensitive? It's just, these are just cartoons, like just, you know, it just, it's all right, just suck it in. It's part of Europe and the Western societies. Uh, we, we make fun, we poke fun, and this is just all in humor. And why are they so sensitive about their religion? And the public understanding is that Muslims get too sensitive when it comes to their own religion, and they just need to find a way to sort of separate themselves out from their religion, so they should have a kind of symbolic relationship, so they shouldn't take offense. Like, after all, we do all sorts of things to um, Jesus, peace be upon him, why not Muhammad? And of course, these are not equivalent correlates, but um, th so the argument goes. Um, what's interesting about this uh, case is that people would often say it's Muslims are too attached to their, to their prophet, and he is too holy for the, uh, for uh, Muslims to be made, you know to be poking fun at him or non-Muslims to do so. And I argue actually it's not really a religious sentiment at all. I think that the caricatures, first of all, it was the nature of those depictions already um, for a minority who's kind of down and out in in Denmark, uh, who is not you know um, who struggles to to be involved in sort of Danish life, who are now provoked with these caricatures of their prophet. Um, who is very much part of Muslim daily life, right? So it's not because the prophet is untouchable and somewhere out there and divine or holy. In fact, it's, I argue it's the opposite. It's because the prophet provides such an ex uh, is the exemplar for Muslims that um, people took it so sensitively. So the frame that I would put it in is not that um, you know, these are religious sensibilities. The frame I put it in is really that these are personal injuries that Muslim felt. And let me explain what I mean by that. It's that the prophet is so much a part of Muslim daily life, those who practice, um, that you know, our movements, how we eat, how we relate to others, should be, uh, we should use the prophet as our example. Um, so it's part of our embodied tradition. It's what we do on a daily basis. Um, so it's not just that he's way out there and untouchable. In fact, quite the opposite. He's part of our daily life, and we attempt to embody it, him. So it was almost seen as a personal injury when the Danish cartoons came out. It was like people were making fun of you or your family member or your mother or father. Um, it was taken in that kind of personal way. And I'm, I can assure you that when most of us would have a family ma member be made fun of, we would probably not just say, oh, just it's all right, you know, we, we should develop a different relationship, let people have their freedom of expression, poke fun at my mom or dad or my uncle or, you know, I, I think we would be hard pressed to, to be able to be that emotionally detached uh, from that. So um, the example I use is, uh, for those who remember, um, the case around Salman Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses. 
you know, when he wrote that book, he was perplexed as to why Muslims would be so offended um, by his book and that couldn't they just develop a, you know, a, a different kind of relationship to their tradition so they can you know, view their tradition as literature or not, again, be so attached to the Prophet. Um, so he was always amazed that Muslims couldn't detach themselves. Um, and I use the example of um, a few years ago, he was, uh, Salman Rushdie was at an event in New York and someone poked fun at his then fiance, uh, who he subsequently married and they're divorced again, but that's too much information. Um, <laughs> he, he um, you know, they poked fun at what she was wearing and he actually threatened the journalist uh, to, to kill the journalist with a baseball bat. He said, if you dare say anything about her again, and he threatens. And I use this as an example to show that when it's personal injury, when someone in our family is made fun of, it's very unlikely that we can keep that kind of emotional poise and just say, okay, go ahead and make fun of them. You have your freedom of expression. Um, and Salman Rushdie, who couldn't imagine why a billion plus Muslims were offended with his book, uh, acted in the same way uh, when his uh, then fiance was, was um, you know, um, spoken about in derogatory and negative ways. So it shows the kind of hypocrisy around that, but it also shows that there's a different kind of public understanding of how Muslims might relate to their tradition. You know, it's not just something that's once a week, it's, it's a way of life. And so these things are, you know, um, we need to kind of understand the Islamic tradition um, in that kind of way as well. Um, and it's hard to do that because, you know, we live in a society where there's a separation, um, so-called separation of um, church and state or religion and state. So for those religions who profess to have a way of life, and that it permeates our way of life, um, I think it's something that we need to uh, sort of um, understand in terms of why it is that, you know, Jews who see themselves uh, living as, uh, you know, Judaism as part of a way of life or Islam and many Christians as well um, and many other traditions, Buddhist, Hindus. Uh, for most people in the world, religion um, comes to be a way of life. It's not something separated out. So I think we need to have a more nuanced understanding um, of religion itself. And I'll try to come back to that um, uh, a bit later as well. Um, the next trope uh, is, uh, in frame is um, uh, veiling in Islamic patriarchy. Uh, again, as if patriarchy is particular just to the Muslim world or just to Islam. Uh, we know patriarchy exists everywhere. Um, and, um, and so um, this kind of focus or uh, obsession even sometimes on just the plight of Muslim women, and usually that's around debates on the veil uh, and veiling. Um, and questions around tradition and modernity. If we could just get Muslim women to unveil, uh, it would be a sign of them going, uh, you know, from tradition into modernity. And we've seen a lot of um, examples of this. We saw this um, in more recent uh, uh, times when Bush sort of made or launched the um, war in Afghanistan through this kind of cause for saving Muslim women, right? Um, conflated it with 9-11 and Iraq, that's a different story, but you know, um, sold the war in Afghanistan based on the fact that Muslim women um, were oppressed and we needed to save them. Of course, there is some truth to that. We, they are oppressed, right? But the fact is that we also have to put this in a larger context or larger frame of saying, well, wait a minute, we are also responsible for having funded the Taliban at one point, um, and now we don't like them so much, um, and we don't like them, but the only way we can get back at them is really through this whole idea of um, getting the women, saving the women uh, from their burqas, right? Um, so this whole um, war was really launched on this pretext of we need to save the Muslim women of Afghanistan, and by saving them, they meant taking them out of their burqas in, into modernity, take them out of tradition and in, into modernity. Um, Bush is hardly known as a feminist at home, you know, so I think it was, it's like, it, it should you know, beg the question of why was he so concerned about feminist and women's rights abroad, and why just in Afghanistan? I mean, he, you know, has worked very closely with Saudi Arabia and other Islamic states that, you know, um, that uh, require veiling. Why was he particularly concerned about Afghanistan and how did Afghanistan get conflated with Iraq and 9-11? So the frame, again, needs to be nuanced, right? I mean, 
We did have a plethora of books that came out. Um, Mavis Leno, who led the feminist majority, was also very concerned about the plight of Muslim women. None of them, it's interestingly enough, none of them were focusing on how to bring safety to them or schools or education. It was mostly about the veil and how we could unveil them and get them out of their burqas as a sign of them coming into modernity forgetting that there's a lot of issues around unveiling Muslim women in the Muslim world, which actually could bring a lack of safety to their well-being, right? Um, so we have to understand these things in context. We have to understand that there are a multiplicity of veiling practices. Um, and I'd say more so to understand why it is that we were so concerned at a particular historical moment, and then we forgot about them. So the, you know, the kind of lack of concern at some moments in history, the overarching concerns at other moments in history should probably give us some pause in terms of our, um, you know, our, our efforts in, in, in other regions. Um, we can get back to the debates around the headscarves. I also want to just include in this section, um, there are new sort of debates now around sexuality. So these kind of liberal markers or tropes that are used to decide whether Muslims are good Muslims or bad Muslims are often around, you know, whether you're for women's rights or whether you are going to be doing interfaith work or whether you are uh, sufficiently detached from the Quran as the word of God or whether you can develop a symbolic relationship to your tradition. And another one is if you're for gay marriage, right, as a test case. Um, uh, and uh, these are all sort of ways in which Muslims are tested uh, to see where they stand. Um, the Netherlands, in Judith Butler's book, uh, Wars of, uh, uh, Frames of War, she uh, highlights that in the Netherlands, until very recently, uh, they no longer use a practice. They used to administer um, tests to different you know, immigrant groups, but especially to Muslims, um, if they had known that they had come from Muslim-majority countries, they would show in the immigration tests um, same-sex couples embracing and kissing um, and asked the Muslim immigrants who were part of their interview if they were comfortable with this or not. Um, you know, so you would have, of course, some, you know, a whole range of people who might say, well, well, in the Islamic tradition, it's not really permissible, but are we comfortable with it? Uh, well, we need our citizenship. Yes, we are comfortable with it, right? Uh, so it's very interesting that they would administer these tests, um, you know, uh, to see where Muslims stood on, on this. And, I mean, it seems a bit outrageous because it's not like somehow... Um, Canadians weren't administered, I'm a Canadian, but, you know, weren't administered those same tests. So was it something particular about Canadians who were not offended by this? Or, you know, why weren't Australians offended by this? Or why didn't other countries get so offended? Why was it just these other countries that needed to be tested uh, on where they stood? And again, this idea that Islam and the Islamic world is particularly averse to um, uh, homosexual relations or, uh, or, you know, doesn't allow for gender fluidity. I just want to cite a couple of examples before moving to the next frame. Uh, we often, um, you know, think of uh, the Muslim world as rigidly, you know, male and female, and it's black and white, and men and women know their place in society, they have their roles, and it's sort of Islamically prescribed. Well, the majority of the Muslim world has a much more kind of fluid understanding of, of, of sexuality. Um, if we look at pre-modern uh, examples of when sort of the Orientalists went to the Muslim world, we used to have travelogues that said, we can't make sense of this because it seems like, it, I mean, uh, sexuality is sort of rampant here, and uh, these are sexual licentious people. I mean, we know that some Christian missions use that to actually discipline Muslims and other uh, natives uh, because they were um, um, too sexually sort of licentious. So it's interesting, the pre-modern ideas about the Muslim world as being this um, harem-filled, uh, you know, um, uh, sex-filled place where there was a lot of sex tourism to a modern and postmodern idea that the Muslim world is actually repressed, right? Um, and there's been uh, this shift, this huge shift of how to understand sexuality in the Muslim world. I'll just cite a few examples that might uh, uh, be surprising. Um, today, in the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, they have legally recognized the third gender. So you can be male and female, and you can be the third gender. This is the Islamic 
republic which is so-called repressed, that doesn't have women's rights, that you know is uh, Islamic, uh, and by their, you know by that extent um, oppressive, and yet there is this kind of um, uh, gender fluidity, right, that has recognized them. Uh, we know that the economic disparities for those who are the third gender um, are harsh, so the government has actually established a program to include the hijras as tax collectors. And they're tax collectors because hijras, historically, th those are the intersex or the transsexuals, are seen as having certain kinds of powers, right? So they can have the power to curse as well as having the power to bless. So you see them often as performers at weddings. You see this throughout South Asia, in India as well, Bangladesh. Um, you see them as um, blessing when there's a baby in the family, so they'll come to bless. But they're also um, hired to offer prayers so it keeps the so-called evil eye away. So the interesting thing of hiring them as tax collectors, um, what they also do well is they shame people in public. So if you're not paying your taxes, they go door to door, they begin shaming you and cursing you, and it actually works. Um, so people start taking this seriously. So again, in the Islamic Republic, right? Uh, uh, Islamic State of Pakistan. The other thing is, um, the, one of the most popular shows in Pakistan is by um, a, a guy who's in drag, right? Um, one would not think that, uh, you know, Begum Nawaz Ali is this, this guy in drag, and it's the most watched show. Um, so again, this idea that we have about an Islamic Republic and what actually happens on the ground and what people watch and what people are actually doing can look hugely different. And that's different because of the frames we use to understand people. And even when you begin telling these stories, people find it very hard to believe. They're like, no, wait a minute. I, just after this lecture, just go and check it out. I'm sure many of you will. And you'll see the episodes. Also, the things that can't be said explicitly um, in Pakistan um, are said through the show. So you can use humor, you can use drag uh, to say things that you otherwise would not be able to say or ask the kinds of questions you could because you know, humor allows this kind of possibility. Again, if it were so repressive, then how do we make sense of, um, of these kinds of possibilities? And of course, Islamic states differ widely uh, on these issues. In Iran, for example, um, because they have an understanding that men should be men, and there are certain roles, and women should be women, the government feels that it's their responsibility as an Islamic state to offer uh, paying for um, uh, sex reassignment surgeries. So in Iran, they actually pay for it because they feel that um, the sort of body-mind alignments um, are not of one's own doing or, uh, you know, uh, and that those realignments are an Islamic responsibility for us to take care of so that people could live out their maleness and femaleness. So it's, again, interesting. Two different kinds of um, Islamic states, very different practices. And then we have lots of examples. Uh, Indonesia, again, the largest Muslim uh, majority country in the world, uh, 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 identifies, there's five genders that are identified there. Uh, there's the Boyat in the Gulf uh, that uh, are women who live as men. Uh, in Afghanistan, tragically, a lot of girls live as boys because it actually allows them more mobility. And then when they hit puberty, they have to live as women again. So, you know, we can agree or disagree. We can find um, fault with these things. We can actually be thrilled that this stuff is happening. At the same time, um, I think it's important to realize that these are the nuances and the, the lived experiences um, of people that we often uh, don't hear about uh, in, in, in news media. Um, the fourth uh, frame is Islam and the West. So this idea of whether Islamic values are compatible with Western values. Um, usually these are around discussions on democracy, a clash of civilizations, uh, Sharia taking over. Um, so the second example of, I had of Sharia was last year uh, during Thanksgiving. Um, just before Thanksgiving, the week before, there was a flurry of emails about the company Butterball um, offering halal turkeys, selling turkey uh, turkeys that were halal. And um, again, Pamela Geller and her sort of Stop the Islamization of America group put out these ads and, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, these emails that said we should be really careful. This is a good example. Halal turkeys and butterball are good examples of how Sharia is taking over this country. Um, you know, again, this hysteria around that. So, and actually many of us thought it was a joke, and of course it wasn't, you know. I mean, it was widely spread. There was email circulating to boycott Butterball, uh, boycott uh, Whole Foods because they were going to offer halal products. And so um, this is the kind of hysteria we point to, even though there's been a long tradition of 
offering different kinds of you know, meats and uh, products to different kinds of religious groups uh, in this country. And, um, and for no other reason than even just the crass capitalism of it. You know, the, it's, it's, it's a money-making thing, so it's, it's good for a lot of businesses to offer these products. They're not necessarily being sensitive to other traditions, but it's certainly good for business. Uh, um, you know, so um, there are different ways in which people sort of come to think about um, Islam and Muslims, even if it's kind of economically uh, to their advantage. Um, so that was, the, that was the point about Islam in the West. Um, there's also, maybe I'll just say a little word about this and then we can maybe take it up in the Q&A. There's um, the point I was making about secularism earlier. Um, part of uh, this idea that there's, you know, this country is, of course, a very religious country, deeply religious country. Uh, no president could take an oath without, uh, you know, swearing on, on the Bible or uh, taking God's name. We have, you know, um, in God we trust on our coins, yet we call ourselves a secular country and we say that there is a separation of, um, of uh, you know, religion and, and state. Um, but there are a lot of studies that show that these are, of course, much more intertwined than we, than we think, and we obviously know that from, um, uh, from sort of just the political landscape, right, uh, in terms of um, telling where people might stand on the political scale. Often we can read into uh, their uh, religious affiliations as well, not all the time, but, um, uh, but very much so um, today. Um, and that's, that's different from even 50 years ago in this country. You couldn't necessarily say, well, Republicans are, uh, or those who vote Republican are likely to be of a, a certain religious community. Um, you know, and you can increasingly say that. So there are increasing sort of ties that we can tell by political parties and religious affiliation. What's interesting is that um, this whole idea of the separation of religion and state, when it comes to the Islamic tradition, uh, the work of Sabah Mahmoud has shown that the state is actually heavily involved with influencing religion. And what do I mean by that? Um, she looks at um, uh, the White House started this kind of Muslim world outreach program a few years ago just to see how they could better understand Muslims. And they sort of carved out some of their work based on the RAND report, a 2003 RAND report and then a 2007 RAND report, which basically said, um, the problem here is not that we um, uh, have a problem with, uh, with uh, Muslim terrorists because they will come and go. It's not ne necessarily the violence. The real problem is actually um, the Muslim traditionalists, uh, the 2003 report shows. And the, what they mean by that is that those Muslims who adhere or follow the Quran as the word of God and who believe the Prophet uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, to be the example, the lived example in their everyday life, that these are the Muslims we really need to worry about because longer term, these are the people who can't actually detach themselves from their tradition. Now, there's a major problem with that because that is most Muslims <laughs> who are practicing will say that. Many who aren't practicing will still often say, well, yes, of course, the Quran is the word of God and the Prophet is our example, again, whether they're practicing or not. So you're basically asking for Muslims to detach themselves from the tradition to become um, good Muslims. So this RAN report, um, in the first report, it showed that it wasn't the terrorists, it was the traditionalists, and by that they mean really the majority of um, Americans and maybe Muslims in the world today who just see themselves as being attached to their tradition um, in these ways. The other thing about that is that um, there's all sorts of studies that show, again, contrary to popular belief, that the more mosque-going you are, and we see that in the U.S., the less likely you are to be attached to kind of terrorist groups and whatnot. Again, the popular imagination thinks, you know, mosques are breeding grounds for terrorism, the mothers are breeding grounds for terrorism, and studies show quite the opposite, right? Um, that if you are healthily involved with a mosque community, it's very likely, um, unlikely that you'll engage in these things. And I would argue it's very simple. The five daily prayers for Muslims um, invoke the Abrahamic tradition. We pray for people. People forget that there's 17 cycles of prayer in which Muslims invoke prayers for Christians and Jews as part of that tradition, right? We ask for peace and blessings on Abraham and his progeny and ask for peace and blessings on Muhammad and his progeny. And so that's part of the daily canonical Muslim prayers that all Muslims pray. The Hajj that I just mentioned, the pilgrimage that just begins to Mecca, that all Muslims are, uh, it's a pillar of Islam that all Muslims are, uh, if they're um, able to do, um, uh, must do once in their life. 
at least, um, is another example of how Muslims see themselves as part of the Abrahamic tradition, right? Um, that, it's, uh, that it's in line of this long uh, tradition that predates Islam, but that Islam comes as uh, a culmination of these traditions. Um, there are other rituals, for example, um, the ritual of going from Safa and Marwa, the two mountains where uh, it's a reenactment of Hagar uh, in the wilderness looking for water. It's, an, it's a ritual that Muslims enact. So when you hear about Muslims not being uh, thoughtful about women, um, this is, an, this is a, a ritual that all Muslims who make the Hajj reenact as a remembrance of, of Hagar and um, her search for water uh, in the wilderness, which God uh, provides through um, uh, you know, the well of Zamzam. So this, this, this idea of uh, the RAN report, of 2003 RAN report, was that you know, Muslims the ones that we need to worry about are the ones who are too ta attached to their religion, um, again, which makes uh, most, most Muslims, I would say. The other thing around that is that um, um, there was issue around, well, how do you include more Muslim women? And many Muslim women who see themselves increasingly as, you know, as uh, who would call themselves Islamic feminists are actually going back to the tradition for their liberation. And I know, I know it sounds odd because the, the, maybe the sort of more popular thinking is the less attached we are to our scripture, because often in the, in the Christian tradition and other traditions, we see scripture as the source of the problem for women. So if women are attempting to be liberated, they would be uh, less attached to the Bible. Well, in the Islamic tradition, what we're seeing amongst the Islamic feminists is that the more attached you are to your tradition, the Quran and the prophetic um, uh, paradigm, the more likely you are to find uh, tradition uh, to, uh, liberation because working within the tradition actually provides you more rights. Well, interestingly, feminists will not take that as a feminist argument because they'll say, well, we don't agree with you, your version of feminism, because it's actually based on scripture. So they refuse or reject Islamic feminism based on procedural grounds because um, in the Christian tradition, it would be a rejection of the Bible uh, or rejection of some of the verses of the Bible towards liberation. And in the Islamic tradition, what we're seeing is many Muslim women who are going back to the tradition as a form of liberation. So again, these are very different kinds of um, ways in which to think about feminism in these traditions. And I think the RAN report kind of got it wrong. And the next iteration of the RAN report in 2007, I think was even worse. It, uh, it just started saying that you need to be working with just um, uh, Muslims who are not, again, so practicing, who are not so attached to their tradition, um, ex-Muslims, secular Muslims, cultural Muslims. You need to be working with feminists. You need to be working with um, uh, uh, academics, you know, claiming maybe that academics are not so attached to their tradition or maybe they see things in more nuanced ways. But again, this, this idea that um, the, the, the best Muslims to work with are the ones who are least attached to their tradition and who are more sort of American and like us. I think it's probably an appropriate time to read the quote from Andrew Shryock's book called Islamophobia, Islamophilia. And it gives you the sense of what kind of markers there are for sort of the good Muslim in America versus the bad Muslim. Um, and this is kind of what he says. He says, um, the good Muslim as a stereotype has common features. He tends to be a Sufi, ideally one who reads Rumi. Um, he is peaceful and assures us that jihad is an inner spiritual contest, not a struggle to enjoin the good and forbid the wrong through force of arms. He treats women as equals and is committed to choice in matters of hijab wearing and never advocates the covering of a woman's face. If he is a she, then she is highly educated, works outside the home, is her husband's only wife, chooses her husband freely, and wears the hijab, the headscarf, um, if at all, only because she wants to. The good Muslim is also a pluralist, recalls fondly the ecumenical virtues of medieval Andalus, and, in, uh, and is a champion of interfaith activism. He is periodically moderate, an advocate of democracy, human rights, and religious freedom, an opponent of armed conflict against the U.S. and Israel. Finally, he is likely to be an African, a South Asian, or more likely still an Indonesian or Malaysian. He is less likely to be an Arab, but as friends of the good Muslim will point out, only a small portion of Muslims are Arab anyway. 
you know. So again, this this idea of what constitutes the good Muslim and what um, you know what kind of conjures up in our minds when we think of good Muslim, bad Muslim, or those Muslims out there versus those good Muslims at home. Um, this kind of I think uh, captures um, that sentiment. And then the last. Uh, media pillar is, uh, is the Middle East. Um, and of course, the focus on the Arab world as the Muslim world, um, and uh, especially uh, questions around Israel-Palestine. So of course, there are other reasons, you know, the founding of Islam in, in the Arab world, the place, place of pilgrimage uh, uh, being in Mecca um, and in Saudi Arabia, and then, of course, the Arabic language uh, are, 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 of course, at the fore of the Islamic tradition. So these also continually tie in uh, Muslims to the Middle East. Um, and we rarely, you know, hear the kind of beautiful Islamic art that's happening. It's usually when, when we talk about the Middle East, it's violence, it's political. Uh, we do actually, to be fair, hear about uh, the shopping malls in Dubai and the great sort of, uh, uh, sort of fantasy world that's, that's being created in that part of the Gulf. But, but for the most part, when we think of Middle East, we think politics and we think of sort of uh, kind of negative uh, stereotypes um, around that. It's, it's never really um, uh, positive. Um, and this also forgets, again, the large history of Muslims in this country, uh, the fact that Indonesia is the largest you know, Muslim-majority country, that the uh, largest area that Muslims live in in the world is in South Asia, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. So I think um, this idea that the Muslim world is um, just in, in the Middle East or that Arab and Muslim are often conflated needs to be uh, more nuanced. And it's, of course, very difficult to do because the Middle East is in uh, the daily news, um, and it's very hard for us to, to, to be removed from it. Um, I want to move now to um, some of the studies uh, about who speaks for um, Islam. I mentioned at the outset that there was a, a large kind of survey, a study done um, by Dr. John Esposito and Dalia Mugahed uh, through the Gallup um, organization. And they studied sort of attitudes of, uh, in the Muslim world. And their, uh, their book is, um, is entitled, uh, Who Speaks for Islam? What a Billion Muslims Really Think. Um, it's slightly dated now, but there's a lot of updates on the website. If you go to um, uh, Who Speaks for Islam website, you'll get a lot of information um, on the actual methodology and how they went about asking the questions that they did and the countries they reached out to. But very briefly, there were nine major findings from this study, uh, which sometimes we find surprising. Sometimes they're very simple, um, but actually they show the, the data shows that you know this is kind of what is going on in the Muslim world. And again it doesn't often fit the frames that um, we sort of imagine Muslims and Islam through uh, in this part of the world. The first is, um, who speaks for the West? Uh, Muslims around the world do not see the West as monolithic. They criticize or celebrate countries based on their politics, not based on their culture or religion. Dream jobs. When asked to describe their dreams for the future, Muslims, surprisingly, don't mention fighting in a jihad, but rather getting a better job. <laughs> you know, again, the kind of everydayness of Muslim life that we forget about, uh, right? It's, it seems shocking to us. Yes, it's just getting a job or getting your, school, uh, your kids to school on time or, you know, uh, just very simple things. Um, you know, um, but again, it takes this huge worldwide survey to, to sort of tell us this. Um, the next one is radical rejection. Muslims and Americans are equally likely to reject attacks on civilians as morally unjustified. They've separated out Muslims and, and Americans because they're talking about Muslims in, uh, outside of America, so Muslims in, in the Muslim-majority Muslim world. Um, so, um, yeah, so that these are morally unjustified. And maybe just to add to that, as we know that there's been a lot of coverage on ISIS, um, and, uh, you know, IS, ISIS, ISIL, you probably heard it by different names, you know, and um, yesterday there was an open letter that was published by uh, worldwide clerics that showed how ISIS is actually un-Islamic. Uh, they went through all the verses, they've gone through speeches done by al-Baghdadi and shown how he's really taken this on as something, as, as an individual who is, you know, sort of hold, holding this sort of mantle of authority, uh, which he has no kind of Islamic... Uh, permission to do, and it completely goes outside of the Islamic tradition. So, 
um, there's this 23-page letter. Um, it's, it's very readily available online. I'm happy to uh, provide uh, sources uh, uh, after the program. Um, but it just shows that because there's a lack of centralized authority in Islam, there's also the opposite, which is, you know, that in some ways, whatever Muslims want to say about the tradition can hold because there's no one authority that one can turn to. When you add to that, uh, you know, so without the kind of equivalent of a, of a papal authority or centralized authority or institutions, um, without that, and, and of course inclusive now of social media, anyone and everyone can say anything about Islam, whether it's part of the tradition or not. You can have these so-called experts and authorities from bin Laden, who was you know, in the construction company, and then becomes a theologian. You know, al-Baghdadi, who has some more qualifications, but still takes it on upon, upon himself to, to, uh, you know, um, uh, to become this authority. Um, and so one, one could argue that this is actually a, res this is, uh, a response to the lack of authority. So on the one hand, we ask for Muslim uh, countries and Muslim-majority countries and the Islamic tradition to be more democratic. And I would argue, on the other hand, what we actually need is more authority and centralized authority because the lack of it is actually leading to some of uh, the violence that we're seeing around the world. And it seems counterintuitive, right? On the one hand, we want more democracy. On the other hand, the U.S., often works with uh, these autocratic regimes, partly because they have some control over their own populations, right? Um, and there's, uh, we can debate that, but often this is a lack of, uh, of authority. So these individuals who are carrying out uh, their violence are often non-state actors, right? These are, um, with probably the exception of, of uh, Israel-Palestine, we see you know, Al-Qaeda and groups like this or those who profess to be creating an Islamic state really working outside of Islamic norms and, and, and working outside of state norms as well. And we can come back to that in the Q&A. Um, the next uh, point that uh, this study shows is, uh, is really around religious moderates. Those who condone acts of terrorism are a minority and are no more likely to be religious than the rest of the population. So I think it's a key point. Um, often uh, we look to um, the Islamic sort of theology or religious tradition to try to figure out why is it that Muslims behave the way they do. And I would strongly argue that, in fact, we, what we really need to look to is the kind of social, political, economic, psychological context uh, in which terrorism happens. Um, even when terrorists are making their claims on religious grounds, we really need to look at that more seriously. I, I think that most of them don't have much to stand on religiously and theologically, and most clerics will show that. Um, all the kind of fatwas against these terrorist uh, leaders uh, show that they're in fact acting un-Islamically. So what then do we need? I, I would argue we really need to study the social, political, economic context um, and the psychological ones rather than just um, just theological or religious ones. So yes, some of us want to know about what the Quran says about X, Y, and Z, but I don't necessarily think that provides us the answer for why the extremists behave the way they do. Um, and why do they behave the way they do in certain circumstances and not in others? Um, I think that that's a really um, uh, an important question. And maybe related to this as well, and we can bring it up um, in the Q&A, is uh, more largely the ways in which you know, the violence that we perpetrate in the world is always in the frame of we're bringing freedom to others, right? Or this is justified because it's, it's for the good of others. And we often believe that, and maybe we're right to believe it, because we hope that we're not really bringing infliction and pain and suffering to others, but violence has a way of doing that to all of us. So we're always, we sort of take the moral high ground that when we bring suffering and um, you know, devastation to others, that it's always for their freedom and their good. And we're sort of these moral uh, authorities on that. But when it's violence done at home or violence done to us, it's always evil or it's always irrational. Um, you know, but when you, when you talk to people around the world and have been you know, privileged to live in many parts of the world and you try to get them to think about, uh, about the West, they usually never make fun of religion and culture. Um, they usually say, why is everything so politicized? When you're bombing us, um, you know, and you're doing that in the name of Christianity, we actually don't think that's Christianity. They actually try to make these separations, which is very interesting, because they don't believe that um, God would permit that. So they think that these are political acts, but they think that political acts conflated with Christianity and that this so-called war on terror is really a war on Islam. So people in other parts of the world 
you know, are, are kind of suffering the same kinds of things that we suffer when we see the beheadings. So I would argue that it's not only important to put this in social, political, economic, psychological context, but it's also important to put it in an international perspective, you know, which is hard to do. As I said, those things that happen more immediately in our families, in our communities, affect us more, and we're, we relate to those things more. But to have an international perspective on it, saying that they hurt just as much, they have families, they're trying to provide they're often just the same, um, you know, in, this, in, in, in what they want out of life. And so uh, we hope that that suffering um, is equally acknowledged um, uh, across the board. The next uh, point is about admiration of the West. What Muslims around the world say they most admire about the West is its technology and its democracy, the same two top responses given by Americans when asked the same question. So all of this talk about you know, Muslims being um, undemocratic, I mean, many of them live in undemocratic states, but it doesn't mean the population wants it to be such, right? Um, and so um, they admire the democracy and, and technology of the West, um, which, again, may surprise some of us because we often think, well, you know, Muslims probably don't mi admire uh, the democracy. And certainly the terrorists are, are trying to say, well, these are the t sort of terrible things that are the reason why Muslims are in the condition that they're in, even as terrorists use all the technology to their benefit. As you know, um, media is critical to the work of most uh, of these terrorists. You know, it's central to how they get their messages across. Uh, they need the media to, to create these uh, spectacles, um, and, they, and they create these spectacles to gain certain kinds of legitimacy and authority. Um, the next point is about a critique of the West. Uh, what Muslims around the world say they least admire about the West is its perceived moral decay and breakdown of traditional values, the same responses given by Americans when posed the same question. Again, reminding us that even though we have a separation of religion and state in this country, that there is um, a, a deep kind of um, a commitment to uh, religion and religiosity and religious respect. I mean, just look at what this country was founded on, right? So we have to remember that there, the, the, um, the situation in, in the U.S. is very different from Europe in that sense, and especially of Muslims. Um, you know, many Muslims will argue that, in fact, uh, they can practice very freely in America, that it's a, a wonderful place to practice their faith. It's the politics <laughs> that are, are hard, uh, you know, not necessarily the religious freedoms that are curtailed. Even though we have incidents of uh, Islamophobia around mosque building and whatnot, we also live in a country that is deeply divided. As much as we have that negativity, we also have very positive um, uh, efforts being made. We probably know that uh, the, uh, we've probably heard that there's been uh, sort of, um, there, there have been these bus ads and uh, subway ads in San Francisco and D.C. and Boston and, and today again in, um, in New York City, uh, these anti-Muslim, um, you know, sort of Islamophobic ads that were put out by Pamela Geller um, and stopped Islamization. And it's everything from, uh, you know, between the war on civilized and uncivilized, choose civilization, choose Israel, uh, not Hamas, right? And then there's other ones about how... Um, um, you know, you need to be worried about Muslims as terrorists. And so, um, and it constantly evoking 9-11, this kind of fear factor. And what's interesting is, is even though they have uh, the legal right to post those as, you know, it falls under the freedom of expression um, uh, clause, they also are met with just as many ads that counter that, you know. So you have interfaith groups, you have other groups uh, that put out counter ads and counter narratives side by side with those ads. So it speaks volumes to the kind of um, negativity that's permitted and people get away with doing, but just as much there's all this kind of positive energy um, coming out, um, and we can see that uh, increasingly after 9-11. Um, that, you know, that there are people right there immediately to, to counter the, that negativity. Um, the next point is on uh, gender justice. Muslim women want equal rights and religion in their society. Again, this idea that gender justice can only happen once you're less tied to religion in the West, um, because we often think of um, the Christian and Jewish and other traditions as patriarchal. So the, the, you know, the less tied you are to those traditions, the more likely you are to be free. It was the argument I was making earlier. And in the Muslim world, we're seeing um, something uh, different, that Muslim women uh, don't want to give up their sort of religion. In fact, many of their, the rights that they advocate for come from uh, the tradition itself. Uh, the next point is about 
clerics and constitution. Uh, the majority of those surveyed want religious leaders to have no direct role in crafting a constitution, yet favor religious law as a source of legislation. Again, this could be you know, uh, surprising to some of us because when we think of religious law or sharia, we immediately think you know, hand chopping or stoning. Many of these things are not chronically sanctioned or not even, um, they enter the tradition in different ways. Um, but what's interesting is we never think of uh, religious law in terms of what we would call the maqasid al-sharia, the principles of the faith, which are really ar around uh, you know, life, progeny, religious uh, freedoms, uh, the right to you know, life, the right to property, um, and human dignity. And one would argue that in, even in the Islamic tradition, that the common good, or maslaha, the term I mentioned earlier, is based on these kinds of sharia principles, which we often forget about when we talk about sharia. We immediately think about punishments uh, rather than the, the principles that actually have to be in place um, for, for Muslims. Uh, the next point is... Uh, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, respect. Um, Muslims around the world say that the one thing the West can do to improve relations with their societies is to moderate their views towards Muslims and respect Islam. So this idea, of, you know, combined with the, the sort of moral decay is that there isn't enough um, sort of respect given to religion, partly because religion doesn't matter in the ways it used to uh, before. And so, and of course, uh, religion is central in, in many parts of the world, not just the Muslim world. Um, and it plays an important part of everyday life, even in um, uh, you know, um, democracies and uh, kind of secular states like India. Um, religion is everywhere to be found. Uh, you know, it's just part of everyday life. So uh, in, in that respect, this, this uh, sort of finding shows that one of the places that they, many Muslims in the Muslim world feel disrespected is when their sort of religion is, um, um, is uh, bashed. I mentioned very briefly um, this idea of uh, maslaha and maqasid and you know, the, the sort of pluralism. So one of the ways, this kind of strategies that we can think about, well, we have all this violence, we have all this misunderstanding, what are the ways in which we can sort of have a more nuanced understanding of, of um, of the tradition. If we're going to look to religion, then we, I would argue, look to things like uh, the daily prayers that Muslims do, right? That, again, it invokes the Abrahamic tradition um, uh, and, and other rituals and rites that Muslims do, as I mentioned, the Hajj or uh, charity uh, that's mandatory for, uh, for Muslims. Um, uh, pluralism and dialogue is, you know, I would argue is part of the Islamic tradition. It's everywhere to be found in the Quran. Um, they far outweigh the verses that are often decontextualized and used, uh, uh, you know, towards uh, perpetrating violence. Uh, mercy, uh, rahmah, is, you know, the most often, uh, the, 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 we would argue, uh, the context in which m most Muslims would probably approach the Quran. Um, and so, and there's verse after verse about protecting Jews and Christians, that they have uh, scripture before you. There's an acknowledgement of the monotheists in, in the tradition. Um, there's also a process of how you seek out the best part of, uh, you know, maslaha or the common good, the, the way to seek it out uh, through uh, istisla. So it's this process of, uh, of how you come out um, to uh, uh, work in the best public interest. And as I mentioned, this is through the, the Makassid principles. So the principles that we uh, would say are the goals or purposes, the higher purposes of Sharia, are really to uh, make sure that people have rights of religion, life, lineage, property, and um, intellect. And there are many um, uh, initiatives. You, many of you might know the Common Word Initiative that was done between Christians uh, and Muslims. Uh, there are many interfaith uh, you know, activities um, that happen just to... And they're not always around theology. It's not just like, let's understand your Bible, let's understand our Quran, but they just could be people of faith going and helping the poor or building a house together or you know, doing common work. Uh, and I think most of us actually work in that capacity. Uh, you know, we don't just go and say, well, your scripture says this and our scripture says that, and so we have to find a way to talk to one another. Uh, we usually do that quite organically in our everyday lives, and I would just argue that that's a, um, it's a good way to, uh, to maintain uh, our social relations. Um, the sort of kind of rise of Islamophobia in the USA, uh, we've seen kind of hate crimes also um, both increasing in, in, in when there's media events, large media events, you see that there's crimes against uh, Muslims that uh, increase. At the same time as those crimes increase, we see um, 
interfaith acts and other kinds of acts also prevalent. So these are met immediately, uh, unlike prior to 9-11, these are met immediately with, um, you know, with sort of a place of safety as well for, uh, for those victims. Islamophobia also came up with, you know, the elections, you know, um, uh, people were disturbed that our, you know, the, the most powerful office in the U.S. and the world had a Muslim in it, Obama, uh, you know, uh, Barack Hussein Obama, uh, you know, that he was a Muslim. Um, I say, I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek, of course, but, you know, this idea that um, uh, people were referring to him as, uh, as a Muslim as a slur, it wasn't really till Colin Powell and others um, highlighted that, well, so what, what if he was? Um, and it just goes to show that many of us would be still very uncomfortable with that. And we might ask ourselves, you know, what that means as we, um, you know, but there's other really incredible things that have happened. The fact that he is, um, you know, African and African American, uh, and he was voted in, tells us a lot about where we're at um, in this country. So I think that that's a, a really uh, positive thing. I mentioned uh, Park 51 and how it was used. This idea, again, of good Muslim, bad Muslim uh, that I read from Andrew Shryock and then the RAND report I, I, I uh, spoke about are all um, sort of things that are have sort of what we might call Islamophobic that have been in the public, but there's ways in which that has been countered. Um, I would argue that there are efforts by Muslim communities in the USA that we should look, look to. Um, the Islamic, uh, uh, Islamic Society of North America, which is the largest umbrella organization of Muslims in the U.S., um, you know, puts out a lot of work, has an annual conference, uh, much more diverse, um, increasingly diverse, has interfaith sections. It's, it's a very important venue. The Islamic Networks Group uh, does a lot of incredible work founded by two women in the Bay Area who do a lot of uh, public outreach and education, mostly in schools, with governments, with the police. Um, um, there is Muslim advocates who look at sort of religious discrimination, not just of Muslims, but other religious groups as well. Uh, the Center for Islamic Studies, which uh, I, I direct at the Graduate Theological Union, I have a little joke about this. In 2007, we founded um, the, um, you know, the center, and at the opening, which was November 2007, we had an opening conference, and we really tried, we had two mandates. One is to establish an academic Islamic studies program at the GTU, which is you know, a consortium of various seminaries of different traditions, and we have a center for Jewish studies, an institute for Buddhism, and now an established uh, center for Islamic studies. And at the opening, uh, there was a remark that uh, someone made that they said, finally, we have a venue where all Muslims can actually get together as well, because there aren't many venues where Muslims of different backgrounds can uh, congregate. And they said, all this while, it's been at the annual FBI Academy that we get together at. <laughs> so we're very, we're very happy that there's a new venue that most Muslims who don't otherwise see each other are not just meeting through the FBI's academy, but now through, through the center. So it's, um, you know, it's, it, it's initiatives like that. I think really important, the initiatives that are happening here, places like, um, you know, right here at, at, at the Institute, you know, that these are the places that we should look to, and they're very important, you know, just very local places where um, there are platforms for dialogue. We often forget that, um, that people are often just searching for, uh, for places that they can dialogue and meet others. So I think that we can't underestimate uh, these platforms. There's Zaytuna College also in Berkeley. It's the first undergraduate Muslim liberal arts uh, college in the country. Um, and it kind of goes through a four-year liberal arts curriculum. Uh, uh, students are trained in classical Islamic tradition, but also in Aristotle and Plato and logic and whatnot. And it's modeled at, uh, along, the, uh, along the lines of a lot of Catholic liberal arts education programs. So, um, and they're doing really well, provide a lot of uh, public service programs and, um, uh, and, and outstanding um, edu education. Uh, mosques across the U.S., uh, there have been a lot of efforts at... Uh, making sermons, uh, you know, just uh, highlighting interfaith sermons as well. So we have special occasions where we uh, still do this. Um, the contributions of African-American Muslims, I think not just important for the wider American public, for, but for Muslims ourselves to recognize the contributions that African-American Muslims have made to our own Islamic history. Uh, the Aga Khan Development Network, um, it uh, has done a lot of um, healthcare work around the world, built hosp hospitals and schools, has done a lot of work um, in girls' education, in building um, uh, uh, 
academies, also private schools all over the world, um, and uh, in, is, in, in the area of aesthetics as well. It's the largest um, architectural prize in the world today. Not Islamic architecture, just um, architectural prize, and it awards to um, Islamic architecture. And they think of that writ large, so it could be a bridge, it could be an idea, it could be um, a building, uh, it could be a cemetery. Um, these are the kind of range of activities. And they've just built the largest um, Islamic art museum in Toronto, which was just inaugurated last week on September 12th. Um, and it's called the Aga Khan Museum uh, in Toronto. Uh, and then the Met Museum that has uh, an Islamic art wing that it's just... Um, uh, that it's just revamped after eight years of closure. So those are some of the um, ways in which we might look to Muslim communities. In the media world, there are many uh, efforts that are being made um, to counter Islamophobia. There's uh, Fear Inc. Um, by the Center for American Progress. Um, uh, Allah Made Me Funny, it's a comedy tour uh, done by Azhar Osman and others. Uh, Again, if you can YouTube it, just watch some of it. It'll, it'll just, uh, there's nothing like laughing together uh, to show uh, some of the absurdities of, uh, of these stereotypes. And you know, that's the thing with stereotypes. Uh, many of them are true, right? But how we actually approach them and deal with them is a very different thing. So when you can laugh about some of them, uh, I think it provides, um, uh, it takes a bit of relief, uh, it gives us some relief. Uh, from the seriousness of it. Uh, Little Mosque on the Prairie is a Canadian uh, television show um, that, again, tried to look at sort of Canadian Muslim life, um, again, uh, readily available uh, on the internet. Uh, New Muslim Cool was a film that came out a few years ago, um, and uh, it showed uh, the story of um, Hamza Perez, uh, a Latino convert to Islam um, who works as, uh, you know, in... Um, kind of a detention facility, also helping as a chaplain, but how he gets caught as being someone who's now suspect. Um, and so it's a, it's a really interesting story. It, it also highlights just an American story, uh, you know, and, and also a generational shift uh, of what many Muslims, uh, including converts, uh, experience. Uh, Haji Nur Adin, he's a Chinese um, a Muslim artist who works, uh, whose works are very beautiful, again, readily available online, who, um, whose works, uh, calligraphy look Chinese, but they're actually written in Arabic. Um, and so he uses his calligraphy to, to promote dialogue and understanding. And um, maybe I'll just end with um, a few more things before I can show you this, uh, this video um, that I have called a land, a land Called Paradise. And I, I'll end with that. Maybe one of the, um, one of the points, um, I'll just bring my slide to that. Um, some of the strategies I've been thinking about in terms of, uh, we talked about countering Islamophobia and efforts that are being done by you know, um, many Muslims. Some of the strategies I would argue are um, what I was saying earlier, you know, to provide social, political, economic context uh, for, for some of the findings and not just theological ones. So when Muslims are doing terrible things, we shouldn't immediately say, oh, what are they reading in the Quran to do this? We should look at why they're doing certain things in certain historical moments. Why does it look so different from what they were doing in different contexts? Um, you know, what, ref what references are they making? Um, what gives them the authority to, to make these kind of claims in the name of Islam? Um, so I think that's, um, that's uh, really important to, uh, to look at that context. But also I would argue as Muslims are increasingly just part of the American and European landscape, and as I argued, even indigenous, uh, you know, we have indigenous European Muslim communities in Bosnia and the Balkans, we have African Americans here, that when we have issues pertaining to Muslims and Islam, that, um, that we should try to Americanize or Europeanize the issues rather than just Islamicize them, right? So rather than just saying, um, what is it about Islam that makes Muslims behave the way they do? We should try to also put Muslims in a larger context of just being American uh, or being part of um, different kind of identities. So not everything Muslims do relates to um, the Islamic tradition. Um, I was called out on a recent um, uh, uh, program that I did, and people said you... Not or you're not very favorable to, you know, to Americans, and you have all these critiques of America, and it was immediately attached to the fact that I'm, I'm Muslim, right, rather than the fact that I'm actually Canadian and might have all these critiques of America because I grew up in Canada. Um, you know, so again, this idea that everything Muslims do is attached to their faith and they're motivated by their faith forgets this kind of multiplicity of 
of, uh, of ways in which Muslims identify themselves, you know, or they could have picked on the fact that I'm an anthropologist and sort of have been trained in post-colonial critique. And, you know, it could be all sorts of other reasons, but no, it was highlighted um, that it was because um, I'm Muslim um, and therefore uh, Islam and Muslims are at odd with, uh, with the West and, and that, you know, helps explain why uh, my, uh, and I actually didn't think my comments were so negative. In fact, they were they were pretty positive. Uh, I was told. Um, the other is um, uh, counter arguments or reversals. You know, I often do this in class with students. I say, you know, just as um, 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 uh, women here want to save Afghan women, can you imagine a delegation of Afghan women? Um, you know, strategizing uh, and talking about how they want to come to the West to save women in the West, non-Muslim women in the West, because they're so underdressed, um, or that they, um, or that they are, uh, you know, that they are so oppressed because they actually give into a multi-billion-dollar sexist patriarchal beauty industry, and they don't even know it, um, because you know who are our heroes? They're like Lady Gaga and Miley Cyrus and others. Um, and we don't even know what that's actually doing to many women and, and, and girls because uh, of the way in which they look up to these women as models. And part of that modeling is that you, the less you wear, the more likely you're going to make it on stage. I also ask my students to do some research and say, if you can show me a single um, uh, uh, woman in America who's in the pop culture industry that has, uh, has, that, that has been fully dressed in terms of like from head to toe, and it's, it's almost impossible. So the sexual, you know, um, kind of uh, uh, the less dress uh, uh, that women wear. And I'm not, out, I'm not highlighting the, this to just show some kind of moral superiority. I'm showing it, um, I'm using this example to show that if, Af if we're there to save Afghan women and women in the Muslim world because they're overdressed, and if they just undress a little, they might be liberated. It, it sounds a bit crazy in that part of the world that say, well, why do they think that if we undress, we'll be more liberated? Um, it's the same kind of scenario if women were coming here. And, and the, the problem is that we actually s spend millions of dollars to send delegations across the world to talk to Muslim women about if they can just you know, veil a little less, they might be more liberated. Um, so if we send women, you know, Afghan women's delegations here to say, in fact, the women in the West, you guys are so oppressed, this multi-billion dollar beauty industry that you buy into readily and think that you're actually free, uh, you're actually in chains um, because there's really no way out of it. I use these just, again, as, as, as humorous ways in which if the reverse were to happen, we would think they're, they're just really funny. Uh, and yet there's a real seriousness, I think, to, uh, to all of this in terms of the way in which we think we're liberated, yet we uphold uh, what is very much a patriarchal, you know, capitalist society in which women become these objects. So anything, just the simplest thing, like um, there, there are immigrants who say, well, why is it that every time you want to sell a car in this country, you have to have a, women, a woman not so dressed to do this. Uh, what's the connection with sports and cheerleaders or, you know, or beer commercials and women, scantily clad women? Um, and again, it's not to pick on women, but very obviously um, it's the sex that sells and it's very much a part of our, uh, our advertising world, our marketing world, and very much the norm in this country. Uh, you would be very hard pressed to find any ads to the to the opposite, and I would love uh, for, for any of you who want to email me some of those. We've been trying very hard to find them, <laughs> and they're very hard to find in, in pop culture. And then maybe the last point before I move to the video is, you know, it's important when we do dialogue and interfaith interaction that we don't just like people because they're like us, or, you know, that, oh yeah, I understand you because, look, you're just like me. Um, I think that it's more important to also recognize uh, difference you know, that we understand that people are not going to all look the same, all talk the same, all come from different backgrounds. So just as much as we are interested in finding overlaps um, and things that we share, and I think that's really great for the common good, um, we also need to actually highlight and celebrate uh, difference, right? And that um, we just don't love our neighbors because they're just very much like us. Uh, look, he's a Muslim and he's 
you know, is like me and so he's likable. But I say we really need to move towards a place where we love our neighbors because they're also different from us. And I think that that provides a lot of personal uh, actual gratification as well uh, when we're doing this work, um, that there's nothing like that, I think, that to feel um, empathy towards others, both because they share certain values with you or uh, you know, you overlap with them on certain things, but also because they're different. And I think that's kind of um, a place that we uh, might all strive to move towards. I, I want to end there, by sh uh, but there's a video that I'd like to show on a happy note and then maybe open it up to uh, uh, a Q&A. So if we can uh, please begin the, the video. That'd be great. I want to live in a land called paradise I want to go to the valley of the king I want to live in a land called paradise want to see the birds fly and I want to hear the angels Sing the praises of my Lord so far above As I move poetically with struggle I fall in love I look to the left, I look to the right and all I gaze upon Reveals the source of flowers, rainbows and the dew at dawn Some see before and some see in and some see after I let my sight pierce the chains and see the master I want to live in a land called paradise I want to go to the valley of the king I want to live in a land called paradise I want to see the birds fly and I want to hear the angels sing So many times in my life I ask myself the question What got me, brought me into all this mess I'm swimming in But pain is not and neither harm in the pool of bliss so slap me with your hand or kiss me with your softest kiss Tell me that you love me or that you don't like me now Tell me you invite me or that you don't want me around I won't cry over a world that can't change my life I'll put my money on what lies ahead in paradise I want to live in a land called paradise I want to go to the valley of the king I want to live in a land called paradise Want to see the birds fly and I want to hear the angels sing I try to do right and love my wife and trade and pray and talk I can be anywhere, do anything, and I'm mindful of God. I'm pleased and good and happy and harm, and now I realize that I already live in a land called paradise. I want to live in a land called paradise. I want to go to the valley of the king. I want to live in a land called paradise. want to see the birds fly, and I want to hear the angels. I want to live in a land called paradise. I want to go to the valley of the king. I want to live in a land called paradise. want to see the birds fly, and I want to hear the angels sing. I want to hear the angels sing Oh Oh So I just want to Thank you all again, and thank the organizers, and of course the memory of uh, uh, of Dr. Veninga, and hope that we are carrying his legacy forward as well. So I want to, if there's time for a Q&A, invite 
uh, the audience to, to questions. I think there's a couple of mics that will be passed around as well. Yes, please. Okay, the, the, maybe the question right here at the front, please, and then we'll do the one back, yeah. <clears throat> I probably missed this, but I was wondering what is your derivation, you know, what country your family came from, and were you born in America? Um, so I'm Canadian by citizenship. Oh, uh, well, that's America. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> now you see where all the anti-American comes from in Canada. <laughs> Um, um, so, I mean, I have Muslim friends in Canada, too, so I relate to that. Yeah. Um, but where did your family come from originally? Mm -hmm. We're three generations East African, so from Kenya and Tanzania and of Gujarati, Indian origin. Okay. Um, so I was born in Kenya um, and, uh, like, Obama. <laughs> it's a joke. Um, we share a lot of things. He's Muslim. He was born in Kenya, you know. Um, and, uh, and then we migrated to Canada. So I, I grew up in Canada and then came out to the U.S. in 93 for graduate work and stayed on um, here. So I've been here over 20 years. Well, we're glad yeah. you're here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> glad to be here. Yeah. yeah. There's a question right there, please. Yeah. Could you comment on the role of uh, Sunnis and Shiites in this country, as well as uh, in the Mideast? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an important question, and I didn't hit on it too much, thinking it would come up in the, in the Q&A. Um, so, you know, um, Shias and Sunnis in this country have not, you know, always um, sort of been aligned in terms of uh, their institutions, and partly, as I said, their uh, you know, multiple institutions in this country after 9-11, including with African-American uh, Muslim communities. So um, the communities have sort of just uh, uh, sociologically, you know, developed patterns because of migratory patterns. So you'll see certain communities congregate around those patterns. But also in, in terms of theology, uh, you know, there is a difference amongst Sunnis and Shias, but by and large, they pray together. So, um, for example, where I'm at in Berkeley, and it's not just because it's Berkeley, um, you know, we do have, uh, we do have uh, predominantly uh, uh, Shia mosque in Oakland. Uh, it's called the ICCNC. They do amazing events. Uh, Islamic Cultural Center of Northern California, uh, largely Iranian uh, community. Uh, but many of their members pray with us in, at the Berkeley mosque. So in terms of praying together, in terms of being together, it's pretty much all mosques are open. They would never divide themselves on, uh, on this. Shias, in addition, will have uh, additional prayer spaces, partly because there are uh, additional rituals in their community that are specific to their tradition. So you're welcome to partake of them if you're part of that tradition. But even if you're not, most Sunnis probably wouldn't. So um, uh, by and large, the, the, the relationships have been uh, good. They go up and down as world sort of politics change as well, right? So when the war in, uh, in Iraq began, there was, of course, a lot more Shia, Sunni um, um, awareness, and then that sort of spilled over in the U.S., uh, in Canada, and the West in general. But by and large, they've kind of um, been trying to work together and making sure that America, in fact, f provides a model for how Sunnis and Shias can live. Speaking of Iraq, I mean, Sunnis and Shias lived and intermarried uh, for, for the longest time. One would, many would argue, I went recently to a talk by um, an Iraqi uh, priest who came and said, this, these divisions amongst Sunnis and Shias and Kurds and, and, and Christians um, have been uh, very recent developments, post-Iraq war. You know, and they were there before, and people are aware of it, but to a actually have segregated cities. Uh, we had largely you know, Christian cities like Mosul and others, not so much anymore after ISIL, uh, ISIS. Um, but, you know, historically, uh, they've never felt worried about crossing part of the city to go visit neighbors, partly because they shared neighborhoods. Um, it's only after the 2003 war in Iraq that we now actually find segregated neighborhoods and a heightened sense of, you know, this now Shia rule in, in Iraq that Sunnis feel much more marginalized. Um, and so that has 
very obviously spilt over. The U.S. involvement in Shia-Sunni relations is also very interesting. On the one hand, um, we you know, worry about uh, Shias in Bahrain, um, yet we um, work with uh, the Saudis and the Jordanians and uh, the Gulf states right now in terms of uh, toppling um, ISIS. Right? Um, they won't work directly with Iran and Syria because uh, you know, they, they're sort of rogue states or they don't want to be seen as collaborating with them. But in some ways, um, the Shias are very heavily involved with that as well. It's also interesting that this becomes self-fulfilling because Bashar al-Assad in Syria can now say, you see, I, I told you there were these terrorists. Um, and he can point now to ISIS and say, these are the terrorists I was pointing to. Um, and so this has kind of led to certain coalition of different kinds of communities that come together. But it's very interesting. They, they can drift apart very easily as well. So in fact, we look to the US as, as a model for maybe providing ways in which Shias and Sunnis can, uh, can come together with still accepting the differences, the theological differences. Um, some would argue that those theological differences are, um, are only highlighted when um, uh, we're, in, we're in political turmoil. And when we're not, they usually live uh, peacefully. So thanks for your question. There was a question on this side, and then we'll go to your question. Um, you referenced the RAND report, and if I understood correctly or heard correctly, you referenced years of like 2005, 2007, 2009. Um, and I noticed uh, even in the video that you played at the end, wouldn't really the critical issue be that a terrorist uh, hijacked Islam, just mm -hmm. like uh, terrorists can hijack and, and still do uh, Christian faiths that we have here in the United States by bombing clinics in the name of God or or showing up at, at funerals mm -hmm. uh, and protesting because uh, somebody might be uh, of, a, of a different uh, um, uh, uh, background, uh, you know, so isn't, and I think aren't we now really as a nation, as, as Americans start, from your viewpoint as a Canadian, uh, starting to uh, come to this realization that really it's terrorists, it's, it really has nothing to do with Islam. Would you not say that? We are now approaching that in a more rationalized or, or, or uh, worldview uh, picture, or not? Yeah, I, um, it's a really good and complex question, um, and I really appreciate it. I think the, um, the interesting thing is we're still involved in the business of deciding who is a terrorist and who isn't. So that part doesn't go away. Um, so you know, many in the Muslim world say, well, it's um, American politics and the bombing of their countries. That's terrorism, right? And on a scale of what registers um, in death dealing, you know, many people who experience that will say, well, that's terrorism when your family's split apart or bombed or whatnot. That's, that's still terrorism to them, even though it's couched in terms of freedom. Um, I think that, yes, there are, um, We've arrived in so far as you know we can see that there are um, people who do crazy things across traditions and cultures, and also in the name of their religion, even though it's a political act. Um, and I think we're getting closer to that. Simultaneously, when we do that, we we give up other kinds of uh, questions. You know, um, for example, no one seems to be questioning the incredible alliance that we have with Saudi Arabia, um, right? And one could argue that that's where a lot of um, sort of uh, uh, sort of extremist uh, theological views are exported to the world. But we don't question as much because we have different kind of relationship with, uh, with the country. Or we certainly are not in the business of telling women to unveil in Saudi Arabia, but we are in other parts of the world. So I think that um, you know, it's still very um, uh, difficult to, you know, and all of a sudden we've developed these relationships with the Gulf countries and the Muslim world fighting the common terrorists. Um, and yet we have a responsibility in you know, asking the question around what is our involvement in creating that uh, situation, right? Um, there was a recent article that just shows that um, part of ISIS uh, you know, um, uh, has actually uh, been funded by the rebels that we were funding in Syria to counter the uh, al -Assad, uh, Bashar al-Assad's regime, then then sort of broke off, um, you know, uh, and um, so, you know, we're heavily involved, 
uh, with these groups. And so I think that once that's exposed, it's not very easy to say that we, you know, we form some kind of understanding uh, because that could change just as easily. Um, I think that you know, yesterday's terrorists uh, become a different kind of group today and then you know, um, something else takes its place. Um, I think the larger question is what is America's uh, involvement with all these different groups? Um, and now there is a crisis. You know, for three years, we didn't actually do anything in Syria. And now there is an, a huge crisis in front of us, um, including a crisis for Muslims ourselves, which is we have all these unqualified um, young jihadis who are being recruited from around the world, who are not part of any established community that go as individuals um, and are being recruited to, to carry these things out. Um, so I think, I think there's a lot more work. I think there's a lot more public understanding, certainly. Um, and, and people, I think, are by and large careful, or at least a little more careful um, in the kind of things that they, they say. So certainly we have to kind of um, acknowledge that, you know, that it's not all negative, it's not all bad, that there's been huge efforts. And as I said uh, ahead, even for all the kind of Fox News fear mongering, there's just as many stations that will provide sort of more, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, qualified statements and, you know, a more balanced perspectives. And I think that that's, that's the great part of this uh, country, you know, that there's so many different views and uh, you have different perspectives and you can seek them out. So I probably worked around your question, but I hope it answered some of it. Uh, there was a question up here as well, please. Assalamu alaikum. Thank Glad to have you over here. Uh, so thank actually, you. I want to know that during your research, what was your actual point of focus? Is it Islam or the cultural society, cultural Muslim society? And during your survey, what you actually come up with that either Muslims, they really relate with their things with culture they are living with or the Islamic point of, mm -hmm. or through po Islamic point of view? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a good question. So I just to uh, um, clarify that, that survey that was done, uh, the findings that are in that book are not a survey that I participated in. It was just, I was just reading from that survey. But my own research, you know, I had a theology background and then I moved from kind of textual studies of what does Islam say about X, Y, and Z uh, to uh, what do Muslims actually do and believe in in all their complexity, you know, whether it's Islamic or not, how do Muslims actually articulate what it is to be Muslim in addition to other identities. So my research has actually focused, I, I shifted from religious and theological studies to anthropology because I was actually interested in what people were see, uh, saying and doing. And um, I ended up working um, initially with imams throughout New York City um, as a way in which to think about how um, mosques are uh, dealing with issues of education uh, of their communities and congregations. And I moved from, uh, I say my research actually moved from mosques to museums. I began working with Muslim artists as new ways in which to conceptualize um, what you know, who Muslims are. We never think of artists as the first place to go if we want to learn something about Muslim experience, uh, and where we think we find them. They're certainly not all at mosques. Many of them are, uh, but uh, they're also in museums, and they're also mainstreamed in other places. So my research actually looks at kind of um, the diversity of Muslim experiences in America, including the work of uh, artists. So people like Lina Khan, um, who was, uh, you know, this artist who did this video, who used the musician Kareem Salama, who's actually a country music uh, musician, Muslim, and, uh, and they collaborated. And so um, I'm looking at how artists are attempting to make uh, sort of a platform to, um, to sort of dispel some of the stereotypes. Again, not to not to be trapped by this kind of good Muslim, bad Muslim. They're artists, and so therefore they're good Muslims because, you know, artists are good people, and they're already on the margins of society, and they're hardly going to, you're hardly going to find, you know, um, an artist who is a terrorist, right? So there's that kind of um, thinking as well. But what I also found interesting in my research is that um, even though many of these Muslims identify, I mean, these artists identified as Muslims, and after 9/11, they were identified from the art worlds as Muslim. Um, th there's this kind of sense in the art world, especially in New York, which is a very competitive art market, uh, which I studied as part of my dissertation. What's very interesting is um, religion is actually marginalized. You know, so if you're a veiled woman in the art market in New York, there's almost no room for you because 
almost no one is attached to religion, even though we know there's the history of art. Art history is filled with religious uh, icons and paintings and, and whatnot. Um, but, but the logic around that is that those who are sort of working in the art world are less likely to be religiously committed. And in my research, I was actually finding that there were artists who were both religiously committed and they were artists, um, you know. And again, it it it, it um, undermines this idea that for artists to be good artists, they have to be less attached to their religious traditions. Uh, and I was actually finding in my research that many of these artists were, in fact, uh, practicing uh, very much attached, even though that wasn't the focus of my study. I was actually looking at what it means for them to be Muslim, however they articulated it. I found that they were very committed to the tradition as well, um, and they were good artists. Um, so. There's a question here, please. Yeah. Oh, sorry, there's a question up here as well. So, uh. Yes, ahla wa sahla. I'd like to uh, ask about your, um, um, your um, very um, self, or not self-conscious, that's not exactly what I want to say, maybe dedicated uh, um, use of the separation of religion and state uh, rather than church and state? Yeah, it's an inter I was just probably trying to be more inclusive, <laughs> but it's a separation of church and state as, as we know it in this country. And the reason I was invoking religion and state is um, partly because um, maybe the founding fathers had envisioned that there would be other religious traditions, but they were really thinking along the lines of Christianity and, and, and the state. You know, So now that we have new religious um, actors uh, in the scene, we need to think about religion in new ways as well because not all religions follow the model of Christianity. So because Christianity went through this enlightenment and reformation and, you know, that there's ways in which you could separate out, um, uh, you know, the religion from what we now call secularism as a political project, not all religions map out very easily onto that same model. So this idea that... Um, uh, this, the the idea of secular the the secular is just this kind of separation of religion and state or church and state, and secularism as a political project is really one in which the uh, you know in which um, uh, the state has no involvement. And as I was trying to show that the state is actually heavily involved because it actually has to protect religious rights. It has to know what the norms of each tradition are in order to know what it's protecting. So it actually is heavily involved with recognizing what is and isn't religion, what gets shown. So in the, in, in, in the Islamic tradition, it's easy. You can just point to the five pillars of Islam and those have to be protected, or you can point to mosques or places of congregation um, and pretty much standard things. But the way in which people practice doesn't always map out. Um, you know, so we've often heard, well, if Muslims just go through a reformation and they are less attached to their religion, then, um, then they might be okay. And I would say that that won't work in the same way, partly because, um, first of all, the Reformation was very bloody, um, you know, uh, and the fight for secularism has always been very bloody and continues to be. Um, and so I would not advocate that we go through the, that kind of violence to bring people to sort of enlightenment. But I would argue that because we're a plural nation, that we find ways and methods within the secular state to acknowledge that different religions might practice their traditions differently that don't always look like Christianity. So Hindus, Buddhists, Jews, Muslims, and many Christians themselves, you know, that there are different forms of that practice and how they're publicly articulated. The other part I was maybe referring to was that um, religion is very much part of the public sphere. You know, you couldn't take an oath of office at, at a certain level without invoking the Bible or God. It's on our coins. It's, you know, as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's everywhere to be found. Um, so in some ways, I argue that religious minorities can actually use the secular system to advocate for religious rights in ways that are, are, are really uh, quite amazing, uh, you know, as they are, for example, in India and other places. is really remarkable uh, in ways in which religion and religious rights um, can be protected according to our documents, our founding, you know, uh, documents. So I think that's something that needs to be... Um, elaborated uh, and, and probably invoked as, as, a, as a kind of positive um, way in which uh, this country has dealt with religion or has attempted to. Very different from the European context, of course, as we know. Uh, there's a question up here that, uh, yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, 
Sorry. That's all right. Anyways, uh, I had a question. Um, would you agree that uh, a lot of Muslims nowadays, uh, I'm Muslim myself actually, but a lot of Muslims nowadays in, in their own countries uh, follow their own culture more than they follow the actual teachings of Islam that, that is incorporated. Would you agree that a lot of the extremism and a lot of the, the terrorism kind of ideology uh, is following the, not in an offensive way, but kind of following the, the culture aspects of that? People are, you know, treating their, uh, their religion more as a family heirloom more than, hmm. you know, something that they're putting their heart and soul in and experience with God itself. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really important question linked to the prior question. You know, I think, um, and I probably didn't answer it um, fully, but, you know, uh, we were having conversations earlier about, the, really with John and uh, Jenny earlier, about the sort of relationship between um, religion and culture. And, you know, there's two sides to that. On the one hand, we can only understand the practice of faith in the context of a culture, right? I mean, um, Islam even, you know, it comes as a universal religion, but, uh, you know, the Quran, uh, um, uh, the language is Arabic, right? So it's already particular in that sense. So people can say, well, it's, you know, Arab culture already, even though we know it's the Islamic tradition that's, that's widely accepted by all Muslims. But most Muslims only understand their tradition through their localized languages, cultural contexts, and obviously um, what is um, uh, particular to the tradition, all Muslims will possibly know, um, but there are also sort of cultural elements to it, right? So things that are often mistaken. We hear things like, um, well, a good example is the one you gave, right? Um, if the terrorists were actually more committed to their tradition and knew more about it, they would never be able to do what they're doing because there's all sorts of rules, you know, jurisprudence, there's a fiqh, there's a, a sort of consensus that has to happen around uh, rules and regulations that's very, very explicit and very elaborate. So if they were following that, they wouldn't be able to do what they're doing, right, because they wouldn't have the consensus. Um, and there's other kinds of encroachments. One would also argue they're, in fact, act, uh, are, um, uh, they're acting on individual basis, so which goes against the Islamic tradition of acting in, uh, on behalf of a community. Right, so this idea that we can just do whatever we want, Islam is whatever we say it is, we'll just find a leader that we agree with and carry out our terrorist attacks is not how anything is done within the Islamic tradition. So if they could go back to it. The other is uh, a big you know, topic is always honor killings. You know, it's, it's, it's actually not part of the Islamic tradition. Neither is you know, genital cutting. But we always associate those cultural practices which predate Islam as well as part of the Islamic tradition because many Muslims in um, many societies carry those practices out which are cultural practices. Now if they were adhering to the Islamic tradition, they wouldn't be able to do that. Um, yeah. So one can say that there's there's that need. The problem with that is also that there's this sense that, um, well, Islam should just go back to its purest form without the cultural attachments. Well, it's very difficult to do that. And one would argue that the only way, uh, it's, the, it's really the religion culture debates. You know, one would argue that you can't understand uh, religion or practice it without being within a cultural context. And others would say it's precisely the cultural context that's, um, that uh, if we do away with, then we'll get back to the purity of the tradition. And I think many traditions have that. Um, yeah. yeah, sorry to anybody that the question is next, but uh, I'd like to ask one more question. Uh, sorry about that. But uh, on the Sufi and uh, Sunnis, uh, why is that still being acknowledged in this day and age when that's totally uh, un-Islamic to have secular groups in this religion? Well, I wouldn't say it's un-Islamic to have secular groups. I mean, because people identify as Muslim, and you can't, you know, takfir, which is declaring it someone non-Muslim. It's in the Quran that says that being the, the, dividing your religion in sectors is is un-Islamic. Islamic is one religion, and to do that is is being un-Islamic because we're supposed to be unified. As a religion, sure, but I think that there there could be many interpretations of what that means, right? Yes, you're one community, but you dress very differently from an Indonesian, from a Kenyan, from a, a Saudi Arabian, and it might not even follow the Prophet's um, hadith because he didn't dress like you. Does that mean you're an Islamic? No, it's just that we're in different contexts in different times, and there are certain things that we have to look to, like 
you know, uh, in, in, the, in, for, in, in terms of dress as one example, to modesty. So it's the larger, you know, principles. The other part of what you're saying in terms of either Sufism or secularism, you can't declare, we don't have the right to declare someone as non-Muslim, as many of the clerics will say, unless they themselves declare themselves to be non-Muslim, right? So the open letter yesterday that was sent by all the clerics around the world um, is that you can't, this, this idea of so easily declaring someone non-Muslim because they haven't practiced something or they haven't said their prayers correctly is, um, is not part of the tradition. Uh, you know, I mean, in that case, like half the Muslims would, should be killed for not uh, practicing their tradition and who's to say what that practice is. So I think it's, it's a slippery slope. Um, uh, we have examples now of ISIS using, uh, um, uh, you know, making claims that the reason why they're going out and um, terrorizing people is that they're not practicing Islam correctly. People couldn't do their prayers, um, and so they terrorize them and kill them, saying they didn't do their prayers and therefore they're not Muslim. Well, what if they were recent converts? What if they didn't grow up praying, but they're still Muslim? In fact, they're not Islamically allowed to leave, <laughs> you know, the tradition just because they don't know something about the tradition. So um, I think it would be very, we'd be very hard pressed to call anyone non-Muslim um, within the Islamic tradition. No, no, not, not you personally. I'm saying within the tradition. It makes, the tradition makes it very difficult to... Yeah, I, th I think there, um, you know, there's, we would all strive for unity in our traditions, and of course there's immense, immense diversity from language to dress to practice of faith, and I think that, you know, that needs, that needs to be acknowledged. But certainly people would advocate that, you know, in this day and age, the more we get back to Islam in its proper form, the less likely we are to face all these, um, you know, terrorist threats or whatever it is, the violence that's done in the name of our religion or what our religion has become. Um, maybe one last question or, I, sorry, because I had pointed to you and um, there were two, sorry, but I don't know, maybe we can just take them both very quickly and I'll see if I can answer them or not. Okay, <laughs> right here. This is real quick. Are you familiar with the book, The Faith Club? Sorry? The... It's a book called The Faith Club. Faith Club, Club yes, yes, yeah. Um, I got a lot out of that uh -huh. book, and I thought it was um, a great sort of introduction to religious diversity and people striving to understand mm -hmm. what it means for each of those, in this case, a Jew, a Jew Muslim, Muslim, and a Christian. Yeah. yeah, it's a great point, and it's also from women's perspective, so it, you know, it adds to it. But uh, yeah, maybe that's a sort of uh, a good note to, to end on. You know, a lot of what we might... Um, seek out are, uh, they don't have to be huge and way out there, you know, they don't have to be national and international, I think are just very kind of local interactions, forums like this, um, cl book clubs, um, you know, these are all, I think, very important ways in which we um, build friendships and uh, build understanding, and not all of it's clear to us. Sometimes we read together <laughs> to say, hey, that's in my tradition too, um, it sounds very interesting, and um, you know, to have that kind of uh, opportunity, I think, is very special. Um, and for those who want additional resources, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to, provide, to provide them. So I think in the interest of time, I just want to say um, thank you to you all. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.